I think it's time to get started. I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of CNI, and um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this um, project briefing session that is part of our um, spring 2020 virtual meeting. Uh, our virtual meeting is now about it midpoint. It will go, run through the end of uh, May, and uh, there's plenty more to come. Today, uh, we have a really timely um, uh, conversation here. Um, Mike Furlow from Hottie Trust and Stuart Lewis from the National Library of Scotland will be talking with us about initial steps to building a global registry of digitized works. This is something that um, clearly has been badly needed for a long time. Um, it's challenging in the sense that um, it's not immediately obvious who should take charge of such an effort or how to, um, how to do it sustainably. Uh, but nonetheless, um, it's really important and uh, certainly recent events and um, the uh, closure of most of our libraries, um, our inability to get at our physical volumes um, during the pandemic has really underscored the importance of efforts like this going forward. Uh, we'll hear from Mike and Stuart, and then we'll take questions at the end. There's a Q&A tool down at the bottom of your screen, and I'd invite you to um, add, uh, to, to enter questions as they occur to you during the presentation, um, although we'll deal with them all at the end. Um, but certainly there's no reason to wait putting them in. Uh, Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI will um, materialize into existence at the end of this and will moderate the uh, Q&A. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Um, and uh, it just remains for me to thank our speakers uh, very much for doing this presentation and to thank you for joining us. Over to you, Mike. Well, thank you very much, Cliff, and uh, thanks to everybody for joining us this afternoon or this morning, depending upon where you are. Um, I am really sorry that we were not able to meet together in San Diego at the end of March as we originally planned. Um, there is one positive thing that came out of us not being able to meet in person, and that is that Stuart Lewis is able to join us. Uh, Stuart I, and I have worked together on this project over the last uh, year and a half, two, almost two years now. Um, Stuart, uh, you want to say hello and just wave around? And <laughs> you, you're, uh, yeah, yeah, good yeah. evening from Scotland. Yeah. So um, I'm going to start this off and then Stuart will come back on and we'll trade off uh, on topics here. Um, let me give you a quick roadmap for this, for this presentation this afternoon. Um, what we will do is take a few minutes at the start to talk about a project uh, and uh, the background for this project to, to develop what we are calling a global, but with quote marks, registry of digitized texts. Um, we'll explain how this global digitized data set network came to be. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the reasons that brought us together. Uh, and at that point, Stuart will join us, talk about the research we did into uh, why we need such a service, what it could be used for, the use cases for it. I'll come back and talk about some data analysis and aggregation that we did as part of the project. And then Stuart will wrap it up and lead us into conversation about what a sustainable project and a scalable data set for this service might look like. Um, let me comment about scope to start with. This was a project that we did for a year. We had one year to, to, of funding. So we had to scope this pretty carefully. And as a practical matter, matter we focused on texts, um, most specifically texts manifested as books or book-like materials that is monographs and serials that have been digitized at your library through your own local efforts or through mass digitization programs over the last 20 years. So the project was led by our PI, Paul Gooding in information studies at the University of Glasgow. And I should have said at the outset, thanks to Paul for letting us borrow some slides that he had used in previous presentations here. We've uh, added a few things and pushed them around the network itself uh, included Hathi Trust. I was a co-investigator for the project. Uh, it also included the National Library of Wales, the British Library, and of course, the National Library of Scotland. 
Research Libraries UK joined onto this project as well as an advisor, as an, as an interested party, given the interest of the research libraries in the United Kingdom in, in this particular act, uh, effort. So we came together, as I said, with funding. It was from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Uh, they announced a program in the fall of 2018 titled US-UK Collaborations in Digital Scholarship and Cultural Institutions. And this followed on from several earlier uh, programs and efforts that they had. And the real focus for them was to look at digital scholarship. Uh, how could existence of digitized materials uh, support researchers and in, in their needs? But the impetus for this project began with more of a library management kind of question. And it came from Stuart initially. Um, in the fall of 2018, he got in touch with me and said that the National Library of Scotland was exploring its digitization strategy. And it was trying to figure out how to prioritize materials that should be digitized. And it was curious to know whether Hathi Trust could help to avoid duplication of effort. Were, you know, really, were there ways for us to work together to help identify things that were held in, in Scotland uh, in the National Library that had already been digitized and therefore did not need necessarily to be digitized again? And my response on this was, let's absolutely work on this because we at Hathi Trust had a really strong interest uh, ongoing in understanding the scope and extent of mass digitization. Um, the collection that we hold in Hathi Trust is substantial. It represents a very large portion of what's been scanned through mass book digitization programs. I'm going to exclude for the, nom for the moment uh, the kind of work that has been done by ProQuest, Gale, uh, Adam Matthew, and, and many other vendors, really uh, high quality work and at fairly significant quantities. But when I was thinking about mass digitization and putting this slide together, I was thinking about work like Google, right, Internet Archive. Um, we have in Hathi Trust today about 17.4 million volumes. That's a book on a shelf. That's about 8.8 .8 million titles, both book, uh, rather monograph and serial. Um, but that's not everything that's been scanned and it's not even everything that Google has scanned. Um, the Hathi Trust collection is largely representative of North American mass digitization programs, not so much of Europe, not so much of Asia. Um, and so to get at Stewart's question about how to understand the scope of digitization and how to identify those materials that had already been scanned, um, that really required further work. And that's what led us into this project. So at this point, let me hand it over to Stuart to talk about how the investigation got underway and the work that we did in the, in the following months. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, so as Mike said, we had just one year of research funding from the AHRC, so we had to be quite careful about the scope that we that we had. Obviously, there was no way we could build a global data set of digitized texts um, in that time. So we sort of had to look at what we could do. So we really tried to initially look at two, two questions. So the first one really being, how feasible is it to aggregate these records? You know, we all know that aggregation of metadata on one hand sounds very easy, but actually the devil really is in the detail. So actually, you know, how easy or feasible will it be to do that? And then secondly, if it is feasible, where would the value come to users? Who would the users be? And sort of how would they use it? And then ultimately really, you know, would, would the cost of developing such a resource um, be outweighed by the value that it could bring? So we can just go on to the next slide, Mike. Thanks. So we we had a number of sort of objectives and deliverables that we wanted to look at, um, or we wanted to deliver. So the first was we wanted to undertake a trial matching of data from the UK libraries who are partners and the existing Hathi Trust data set. So actually, could we, you know, obviously it's it's not global, it's a it's a tiny, tiny proportion, but can we at least aggregate our different data sets together? Um, we then held a number of workshops to explore what would be the benefits um, and who would those benefits be, how, what, what would they deliver to people. Um, we then wanted to actually deliver a data set, you know, prove that we could aggregate this data, um, so create a data set that we can publish. Um, and then we wanted to look at, so if this is successful, how could we actually move this forward um, in terms of actually sort of concrete steps, what, what might they look like? in terms of creating then a sort of truly global data set of digitized texts um, and any services that they could um, deliver as well around them. Can we have the next slide again, Mike? Thanks. 
So when, when we first submitted this um, grant proposal, we, we really sort of concentrated around what we thought were three sort of main use cases of this. So obviously the, the, the primary and most simple use case is, is simply, I'm a reader, there's a text I would like to read, a known text, is it digitized somewhere, can I access it? Um, right now, you know, we can use search engines to a certain extent, we can search the big um, sources, you know, we can go to Hattie Trust, we can go to the Internet Archive, we can go to the British Library, we can go to National Libraries, but at some point you, you, just, you just have to give up. Um, so if we had a single data source, then, you know, people will be able to search that and find out very, very quickly if, if their item has been digitised or not. The second use case we were looking at is all around digital scholarship and scholars who are looking for sort of um, corpora of texts that they can work with. So I'm a scholar, I want to look for anything that talks about London in the 1850s. Um, I, it'd be so much easier if I can just search um, all libraries, find all those digitised materials and download them in one go, rather than having to search all these different libraries and put that set of texts together. So that's sort of another big use case. And then the third one being around generally really actually around collections management. Um, obviously, the one we, we looked at there was, as Mike mentioned earlier, if we're doing our own mass digitization programs, how do we, for example, reduce duplication? So we're less likely to duplicate works that are already openly digitized elsewhere. Um, or indeed, there's other sort of other, you know, whether it's print retention things, other collections management um, uses for that data as well. So we first did this through team meetings in Chicago. We did a lot of sort of brainstorming, brainstorming around the sort of agi traditional agile user stories, you know, as a X, I want to do Y so that I can achieve Z. And so we, we came up, we, we really sort of expanded those three initial use cases um, quite a lot. And then we took those to a workshop in London um, in June last year. We had an audience of about 30 or 40 people from a whole whole range of backgrounds, sort of some scholars, some librarians, um, different groups, archivists and so forth, metadata experts, different people, and just looked at what their their use cases would be and then sort of un undertook, you know, an investment exercise. Everybody was given um, a sheet of coloured dots and really saying, you know, what, wh where where would you get most value from this? Um, and then obviously we were able to use that group also to look at um, discussions around things like feasibility, stakeholders, how we could move forward and so forth. And so, yeah, really sort of five themes emerged out of, of those sort of expanding on the use cases. One around, you know, efficiency, cost, impact, value, you know, what, what as particularly around collections management, how can, how can that help us um, within the library sector? Um, discovery and access, there was a lot there around um, readers. Um, there, there was questions that came up about provenance as well and really understanding. So it's, it's great seeing a big list of digitized texts, but actually where have they come from, you know, that's, and how did they get there? That would be very important to some um, users. Um, there were the research case studies as well, particularly around digital scholarship and creating um, corpus of different you know texts from different libraries and then finally actually how what what else could we do with this you know it, it, some of the more exciting parts actually came around when you say well now we have 20 30 40 million texts digitized can we actually do things at a scale that we never could before some of those could be very simple you know can we can we load them into our discovery systems as a, as a single data set um, so that we can make some of our print collections available digitally as well um, but but can we are there things that we can do with those texts that we can only do once we have aggregated them? So for example, once we have the OCR, does that make it much easier to do matching and deduplication than it does if we're just looking at metadata, for example? So we looked at we looked at those areas as well. And then finally, we, we undertook a survey as well of the sort of wider community as well. Obviously, we, we wanted to get many more voices than those that could attend the workshop. So we, we did a, an, an open survey. We had a number of responses. Um, so that brought in sort of more use cases we hadn't really considered before around teaching, um, thinking about where this data set sits in relation to other services. Um, and, and again, like with the, with the workshops, they did see, uh, seem, you know, to be a really a real clear interest in pushing this forward um, as an idea but at the same time um, you know there, there was some caution came about you know 
not everybody understood the concept. Um, there were sort of, you know, a lot of questions very valid about, you know, so you're talking about a global data set, but you know, you've only got a very small subset here and things like that. How, how do we do balance between larger and smaller organizations and different types of collections? And obviously um, with any discussion like this, it all comes down to metadata and quality um, and the analysis, you know, that that, that allows or doesn't allow. Um, so, so you know, there was the those sides that we had to um, consider as well. And so, yeah, back to Mike to talk about then, sort of based on 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 those results, sort of what what were we able to actually do with our own data and aggregating it together? Thanks, Stuart. Um, the, the in this part of the presentation, I'm going to be summarizing the work of several of my colleagues at Hathi Trust: Natalie Fulkerson, Josh Steverman, Martin Ware, and Heather Christensen. There is a lot more to say about the work I'm going to be talking about here. They, they could give a much more detailed briefing on some of the analytic work that they did. And I will show you a link to a blog post where you'll be able to find out more about this part of the work um, in just a couple of seconds. But the, you recall the original inquiry that led this project, right? It was how do we determine what has been scanned and how can that inform digitization strategy? So for librarians looking to analyze collections, there was a real issue there. It seemed to be about the ability to cluster titles, identify that they're equivalent, and, um, and deduplicate, right? Avoid that duplication. Um, but duplication isn't always a bad thing. For a general user or a scholar relying on such a resource, you would expect that some of them might want to find duplicate copies to hedge against the potential for errors in digitization, missing pages, defacement, something like that or even to examine textual variants. So part of what we were exploring in this, in this part of the work was how could we better do clustering of titles? How could we potentially better inform and represent such clustering in a resource like a registry? Um, and I will say that in a year, we can only really skim the surface of this. The first thing we did was rely on an existing process that we have in Hathi Trust to analyze holdings against bibliographic data that we hold. So, and to say very briefly, all of the Hathi Trust member libraries give us information about their physical holdings, and then we periodically analyze those holdings against the Hathi Trust catalog, um, and we use those matches, that match data, to help inform our collection development, our shared print program. Um, it supports some access services, such as our current emergency temporary access service. It informs fee calculations and, and so forth. Um, so typically what we're doing is looking at identifiers in records uh, to, to cluster and match on it in order to do this. So our first step was to gather metadata from our partner libraries in this project. And you can see here a pretty wide range of quantity of records provided to us. Um, the British Library provided us only records for items that have been digitized. And I believe all of this was from their Google partnership. Um, uh, and there are just many more records that they could have provided. Many more items have been digitized by, by the BL than what we were working with. National Library of Scotland and Wales provided us with extensive records for their collections, as well as for print records, print holdings as well. Uh, and then Hathi Trust had about 17 million items at that time. Um, as I said, we have always tended in Hathi Trust to rely on identifiers and specifically an OCLC record number to be able to match bibliographic metadata against holdings. We've relied on this because the vast majority of the collection of Hathi Trust has this identifier in our bibliographic data, um, and it's very common in our member libraries. But our member libraries are largely North American, and what we determined very quickly in this project was that these record numbers, these identifiers, are less common to rare to non-existent uh, in the records that were provided to us by the national libraries. Um, they seem to be more common in the records for print or rather undigitized materials that were provided to us. Um, when we were able to do matching or rather when we were looking at this, it ranged from, you know, 1% of the records had uh, OCLC numbers in them for the BL to about 30%, I believe, for, for Wales. Um, so it's a pretty wide variant there, and obviously that's only going to get you so far if you've got, you know, if you don't have the presence of these identifiers. We have at Hathi Trust also done some work with other registries and looked at other identifiers to try to provide these kinds of matches. Um, for example, LCCNs, ISNs, ISSNs, and so forth, ISBNs. 
the problem, and the, really the problem with the OC, LCID too, is that these identifiers really date only to the 70s at the late, uh, maybe the 60s in some cases. Um, you're not going to find them in very early 20th century or 19th century records if they, unless they have been uh, updated, unless they have been, you know, modified throughout the, throughout the period. Uh, in our collection, for example, only 15% of the records in Hathi Trust have ISBNs. So while we did some ma record matching using that, it was not sufficient to tell us a whole lot about overlap. Um, so obviously normalization is going to be a significant undertaking for any registry that, like this that gets developed. Um, I'm going to talk real briefly here, very briefly, about four other methods we explored to do uh, item and title and record matching. Um, the first two methods relied primarily on string matching in titles. Um, that has a benefit of being quite precise, not very computationally expensive, um, but variation in cataloging practices, variation in titles, and so forth might exclude true matches. Uh, you may not get all of your matches, in other words. We also explored some statistical methods, including a bag of words approach and some machine learning and machine training approaches to help us um, identify potential matches as well. That turned out to be quite promising. We did not have enough time in the project to take it to fruition and, and do it at a very large scale. So that's work we're gonna have to come back to. But that type of work also brings other challenges. It's, com you know, it's computationally expensive and it does not eliminate the need for human intervention. So what, uh, briefly, you know, a quick summary on this is that in addition to, you know, you know that, that analysis is going to have to happen or other metadata normalization is going to have to happen in order to do this kind of analysis. Um, so duplicate detection, clustering across heterogeneous metadata sources is challenging. Um, there are a lot of trade-offs to, to, um, to uh, you know, look at with this. And I think the experience that we had with this suggests that you're going to need a multitude of approaches, right? Maybe a cascading approach where you use identifiers where you can, then you use other methods like machine learning if you um, if you can afford to do that, where you might need to do further kinds of matching with more um, ambiguous results. Now, as Stuart said, we did make a promise as part of this project to deliver um, a record set of aggregated metadata from our part from the partners. Um, we refer to this as the proto registry, which is really a fancy word for a data file, a flat data file that we were going to publish. Um, there was no functionality promise. We did play around with some of that to visualize it, but it was not something we could maintain. Um, we scoped this part of the work to make sure that when we publish the metadata as an aggregation, that is the records of all of these digitized items from these four from these four collections. Um, we wanted that, that record set, we wanted that metadata to be fairly consistent, fairly complete. So we looked first to a model, again, that we employ at Hathi Trust for publishing an inventory known as the Hathi file. We looked for common fields in the records and then aggregated based on uh, the information, pulling them from those fields. Um, and this table gives you a very quick overview of what minimal metadata was included in this as well as a DOI that you can go to get the data set and play with it to your heart's content. Um, and that is all I have to say about data analysis and, and aggregation at this point. Um, instead, what I'd like to do is turn this over to Stuart to wrap up at this point. And Stuart, yep, you're muted, there you go. Yep, thank you very much. So yeah, just in terms of the conclusions and future work, sort of quite quickly, um, a point Mike always sort of really drums home to us, you know, registries are critical um, but undervalued infrastructure. You know, we, we forget about them sometimes, we forget about the infrastructure we do need that will really bring more value um, to what, what we do. So, um, you know, this could be quite an important piece of infrastructure like that. Um, through the engagement work, you know, we get a sense that there really is a need for a resource like this. Um, and as I think, you know, Cliff had mentioned in the introduction, maybe the current situation, the current pandemic actually gives it even more value than ever before. The fact that, you know, our students, our researchers, they can't get to physical libraries. Um, but if it's hard for them to find what has been digitized, then, you know, could this be part of that answer? And then really, you know, for us, as we look forward, you know, what might a, sustain a sustainable project look like? You know, um, as I said earlier, things always come down to metadata, but equally, you know, 
there's always that question of, well, what's good enough metadata to actually make this happen? You know, does it actually matter, for example, whether we can do data matching? Does it matter that if somebody searches for something, they find five copies that are duplicate, but the system doesn't know they're duplicate, you know, this sort of thing, and the cost value um, of doing data matching, you know, it's, it's complex, but how would it, you know, it would bring value, but at what cost? How do we scale this? You know, obviously we were working in the sort of low tens of millions. How does this scale when you, or indeed what, what is the scale of the problem right now in terms of worldwide digitization and the amount of items out there? The big one, obviously business models, funding, sustainability, buy-in, participation. Um, and these are actually really, I suppose, what we're very interested in almost from the Q and A would actually be your views on this, you know, as, as the sort of partners who would be ideal participants in such a, in such an endeavor, you know, what are your thoughts around this in terms of, should we be building it? How do we build it? How do we fund it? How do we get your participation? Um, obviously the issues around, um, updates, keeping it accurate, that sort of thing. There's the questions around other communities, you know, there's, there's sort of work in other communities looking at similar problems. So things like the AAAF discovery, um, that sort of thing, you know, it's, it's part of the answer, not all of it. Um, and then, you know, the big, big one, the, what the work we've done so far is far, far from being global. And the challenges then of um, multi-languages and character sets and, and all this and how we bring that together and does does it merge in, in the same way when we go beyond anglophone collections. So so really as well as you know we're very it'd be great to sort of answer some questions and answers. Thank you very much for coming. It's it's been um, a pleasure to present to you. We're really interested I suppose in your feedback as well just in terms of this as a project, this as a concept and and what you think of us sort of um, going forward in that. So thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Mike. Uh, lots of grist for the mill in that talk. Really interesting and such an important issue indeed, especially right now. And uh, we already have folks who have questions. So let me just jump right into that. And just again, uh, type your questions into the Q&A and Stuart and Mike will answer those live. So our first question comes from Melissa Levine, who asks, um, this approach is focused on published materials. Any thoughts on how to extend this concept to other kinds of materials? For example, special collections type materials, museum, archival collections? Do you want to go, Mike? I can, I can say, um, yeah, thanks, Melissa. Um, we didn't really spend much time worrying about that. And it's not to say that it's not an important problem, but just keep our focus was entirely on published works. It's not to say that it could not be done, um, but the type of my, at least my own limited experience with metadata on archival materials is that the aggregation of that might be even more challenging given um, the, there's, there's not a, the kind of standardization on the data uh, across the board that you find in bibliographic metadata for published works. Um, so I think that's one issue. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it can't be done. Um, I would simply say that we did not have the opportunity to spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. it, it I think it's clear that it would obviously be valuable and potentially even more so uh, because of the difficulty in locating archival material. And there's not a world cat for that in the same way. So Stuart, do you have anything else to add? No, no, absolutely. That's, yeah, as you say, all right, thank you, Melissa, for that question. Um, before I move on to the next question, I just want to remind everyone, uh, go ahead and type your questions and comments into the Q&A as uh, Stuart invited uh, our attendees earlier to share your thoughts, your ideas about potential applications, uh, potential partners, and that sort of thing. So this is definitely a forum for comments as well. Uh, so our next question comes from Kristen who asks you, uh, can you talk us through how this works on the user side? For example, archives usually require registration of some sort, which allow for stats on the types of users, et cetera. Are you gathering that data for users or do you plan to? Shall I answer this one? So, Please. yeah. So this, this was certainly something we ran into with the prototype that we developed because a lot of people have tried it out and they, they searched, they came up with some good results, and particularly those in the Hutti Trust, they were going, but I can't access that, but I can't access that, obviously because a proportion of what's in the Hutti Trust 
due to copyright, due to fair dealing, is for Hati Trust members. And so something that certainly this would need to do, which we didn't actually do in the prototype, but one of the big lessons we learned is really we need to know sort of, you know, as we aggregate this data, we also need to know what the access options are for each item you know is it open what sort of license has it got with it so that when we present this as a faceted search you know you can sort of tick the box that says show me only you know open access creative commons um you know reusable items so that you can facet down that way um so that if people really you know they they want to know or you know maybe there'll be a box that says i'm a hati trust member and then it will open up sort of more content so i think yeah and having that but at a, at a basic level so that we can at least facet on that and, and sort of lighten up or darken um, different parts of the collection depending on sort of who you are, where you are and what access you might have and how, yeah, the produce sort of work required then, how, how we make that sort of usable but also understandable, I think, to people so that they understand what they're searching and what they will have access to because, you know, no, no, we all know nobody likes getting search results that they can't then access. Um, and so, yeah, that'd be a very important part of that. And just, I suppose, in terms of the second part, in terms of statistics, I mean, again, the, the, the phase one project really that we did, the one year AHRC project was really looking around feasibility. It didn't look into sort of how, you know, if we did this live, how would we do things like gathering statistics and things? We did get feedback around that saying, you know, people would actually value more statistics not every library is able to collect access to statistics to the level they would want particularly maybe where uh, materials are getting used in other ways around digital scholarship and things like this and this might allow it would just be another sort of indicator of usage but i don't think you know it would just be in sense user statistics of of the of the site i think rather than it necessarily um yeah gathering data about users as such great Thank you. And thanks, Kristen, for that question. And we have a question from Robert who asks, are you developing or leveraging standard criteria or metadata for faceting on open access, licensed, et cetera? That could be very, that could be very helpful for improving user experience, for example, via simply E. Uh, you want to jump on that one, Stuart? Yeah, I mean, I can do, I suppose. Again, I think this is where, you know, we've, we, we've done a prototype to prove we can do this, but we haven't looked into the details then to say, okay, we've learned we need rights in here. What would be the best way of doing that? And obviously, as, as Robert says, you know, something like Simply E would probably be an ideal standard to do that. So, I mean, it, it's a great suggestion. Thanks. And obviously, you know, if we do move forward, then we can, yeah, look in those different areas where we need to sort of make decisions and, and that would be a key one. Yeah. Uh, that was exactly what I was going to say. I think it's clear that we would need some kind of some kind of standardization and and in use of a normalized vocabulary for that. So right, right, yeah, makes sense. Thanks for that question, Robert. Um, just um, wanting to remind everyone uh, to type your questions in the Q and A. Robert has a follow up here. Let's see. He comments: mapping OPDS to your approach could be very effective. A very effective thumbs up to the answer. So um, I want to go ahead also and invite anyone who might like to make a comment live or um, make a, have a question, want to interact directly with Stuart or Mike. If you want to do that live now, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, we have a couple more minutes here. We can do that. There should be uh, an option to raise your hand, and that will signal to us that you would like to make a comment or ask a question live, and we can go ahead and unmute you for that. Um, while we're waiting to see if there are any other questions to come in, I just want to remind everybody that this is part of CNI's uh, Spring 2020 virtual meeting. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to our panelists for presenting today, and I'm just sharing with you there in the chat box a uh, direct link to the schedule for the rest of the meeting, which will uh, go on through the end of May. Plenty more offerings to come, including a couple more sessions uh, this afternoon, if you're uh, in our time zone. Um, one right after this, implementing effective data practices, and after that, statistical consulting in the library. 
All right, seeing no more questions coming in through the chat box, I will simply um, thank our presenters and our attendees once again. It is our pleasure having you here and we really appreciate your uh, being here with us. I'm